I'm David Crosby. I'm at Virginia State University. I want to welcome everybody to the uh, second session in our aquaculture homesteading for rural and urban, urban areas. Uh, today we're going to have uh, uh, Chris Mullins, who is, has done a wonderful job for many, many years working with uh, hydroponics uh, and aquaponics and greenhouses. And today he's going to cover some of the things that uh, you can do with uh, uh, aquaponics, you know, basic construction, uh, size of units, uh, talk a little bit about hydroponics and everything else. So instead of wasting my time talking, I'm going to turn it right over to Chris. Chris, you have um, the uh, show, and it's yours. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Crosby. I appreciate that introduction. Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, glad to be here. Like Dr. Crosby said, um, I work at VSU also, Virginia State University, part of Virginia Cooperative Extension. And uh, I work primarily with uh, greenhouse vegetable production, uh, and that includes things like hydroponics and aquaponics. And so uh, this morning, uh, as part of this homesteading aquaculture series, we wanted to touch on aquaponics um, as there seems to be a lot of interest uh, in aquaponics. And so uh, today what I'd like to do is spend about an hour or so, um, not too much of your time, but uh, spend about an hour and talk about some very basics of aquaponics and try to go in to some a little bit more detail on maybe some construction aspects and give, give you some overview and things like that and kind of hopefully open the door for you a little bit um, and and make those introductions to us and how we might help you or how might we might be able to find you resources uh, if you're thinking about doing some type of aquaponic production system. Um, I have mostly <clears throat> PowerPoint slides, but I've got a few videos in here, um, nothing too long, but um, sometimes, it, you know, it's always good to be able to go and see things. And unfortunately, during this uh, particular time in history, we're having trouble uh, ha having people come to our research farm and see some of the things that we're doing. So. Um, I've tried to make some videos, uh, short videos, kind of showing some, some more practical things. So with that, uh, and again, I, I don't hope to cover everything because there are, you know, whole conferences dedicated to aquaponics, but we'll try to touch on the basics. And the chat is there um, on, on your screen to be able to type in questions. Um, uh, that we can and try to answer either at the end or during the presentation. So feel free to ask as many questions as you want, and uh, and then at the end also we can have have time for for questions. So we'll go ahead and and get started here. Um, and many of you have already come to this meeting kind of knowing this definition, but I still put it up there because what we're talking about with aquaponics is the combination of two very different systems. One, uh, an aquaculture system, and we think of raising fish when we think of that type of uh, setup. Um, and the other, and most of the time we're talking about, when we think of aquaculture and aquaponics, we're thinking of recirculating indoor aquaponic, uh, aquaculture. And then hydroponic plant production. Uh, that's growing plants without soil, um, maybe in some type of soilless media, or something like that. So, so that's the best definition I think we can think of for, for aquaponics, this integrated uh, system. So this works uh, it, in the simplest way. Uh, we have uh, uneaten food and excreted waste from the fish tanks, the fish production, and the ammonia that's given off uh, through the gills. Um, and quickly, all that becomes toxic to the fish in their in their environment, in their tank, in their production area, whatever we want to call it. And <clears throat> through this aquaponic system, we pump or take that water, that effluent from that from that um, fish tank, let's call it, and it goes to some type of grow bed where we're growing plants, whether it's a, a 
an NFT or media bed or float bed system, and we'll cover those in a little bit. Um, and then it's pumped back or, or flows back to the fish tank. Um, the idea being that the ammonia, the nitrogenous waste is taken up uh, and, and the other, a lot of the other waste forms are taken up by the plants as food and the fish in a very simple way get cleaner water back. Uh, so there's two living things in this system, the, the, the plants and the fish, but there's also the bacteria. We have beneficial bacteria that are in this system that are the ones that chemically convert ammonia to more plant usable nitrogen. We've also got a lot of several other types of, of beneficial bacteria. So these are good bacteria that are helping this system along and these are naturally occurring bacteria, things you would find in nature. So that's kind of the simplest uh, uh, idea of what we're doing here. Fish tank, plant production area, water moves between the two, uh, bacteria help clean it up, and there's some other parts that we'll talk about in just a second. So if you're thinking about this, whether it's on a, 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 a very, very small scale, a homesteading scale, um, uh, an urban or, or rural, no matter what, or, or large scale, there are some things that you kind of need that would make this, uh, make this go better. What, what we think about in Virginia is gonna be a greenhouse. Um, so, you know, that picture down at the bottom shows two very different sized greenhouses side by side. And it just varies, you know, and, and they vary in size even from that. So, uh, but if you wanna have year round production in Virginia, um, there is a need for a, pro a protective um, culture environment. So a need to be able to influence uh, and change uh, air temperature and possibly humidity. Um, and, and a greenhouse allows that. Um, so, um, you need a germination area. Depending on what you grow, you might need a cooler uh, or some type, even if you have this as a business or an enterprise, maybe cool transportation. If you're selling lettuce, for example, to uh, a food line distribution center, then you might need a way to make sure that that stays cool uh, from the time it's harvested to the time it gets delivered to your, to your uh, uh, customer. There's also meters and water quality tests that you'll need. Uh, testing that you'll need to make sure that uh, everything's going going right. We've got a lot of living systems here that are depending on you. So as we go through and look at some of these kind of basic uh, requirements, things that you would, would need uh, in order to build these systems, uh, we think of, of these, these things here. Fish tanks, biofilter, solids filter, some type of pump, and a hydroponic system. And you see lots of pictures here of fish growing and, and filters and things, but let's, let's go through some of these and look at them individually as we're thinking about, uh, about those needs. Um, so some type of fish culture vessel, some type of fish tank, let's call it. Um, whether that's like that top picture, and that's a high school in Virginia where the, the kids have, grown, have built this, uh, wooden fish box you know it's it's a it's a wooden uh container that's lined with uh with some type of plastic material um and that holds water and that's their culture vessel that's what they're growing their fish in you know um you see round pictures on the uh on the bottom there of uh, plastic tanks that you can buy off the shelf from different companies and and as we go through the presentation you'll see more of these types of containers to raise fish in. Uh, probably tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, the next session that you have on homesteading, um, probably talk about indoor recirculating aquaculture systems, and that will probably talk a little bit more in depth about the best fish tanks to use, or the best type of fish tank to use uh, in a system like that. Um, right off the bat, we're just looking at these two pictures, uh, you've got a square, a rectangular type fish tank and you've got this one in the bottom right which is more round so when you look at these two type, types of tanks one is going to be you know they're, they're different one's going to be more expensive than the other but also one's probably going to um, flush uh, solids out of it a little better that round tank if you have a, a flow that is a circular motion it's probably going to concentrate your solid material down in the center where it can be taken away easier than a more of a, a rectangular tank that's real, has a lot of angles and is boxy. 
So when you're comparing fish tanks, there's some good or some bad. When we look at the picture here on this one on the bottom, there's an IBC tote, uh, an individual bulk container type uh, um, container that's um, used quite often in aquaponics. Um, and and it, it's good. I think when we think about tanks, we're a grower or somebody that's interested in doing this is looking for uh, something that's going to be easier for them to access, uh, relatively inexpensive, and work well, and some happy medium between all those factors. Uh, so, so anyway, um, this can be fiberglass, it can be even barrels, it could be IBCs, uh, plastic, even even an aquarium. You know, depending on your scale. So next, you're going to have to have in this system some type of area to grow plants. And we're going to cover these a little bit later, so I'm not going to do a lot of it right now. But the major um, types of plant production systems are going to be float, NFT, media bed, um, and bag system. And like I said, we'll cover those later, but most often, your aquaponic system is going to be defined or named based on the plant production. You know, somebody will say, I've got an NFT system. Well, I use deep water culture and I've got a float bed aquaponic system. It's, it's kind of defined by those names. So anyway, we'll cover this a little bit and a little bit uh, further along. So I mentioned these bacteria before that actually do the job of um, converting some of this toxic nitrogenous waste to something that's a little less toxic to the fish and a little more usable by the plants. So in a system, we've got some type of biofilter. And you look at these pictures here, the one at the top, um, the one at the top uh, right and the one at the bottom right, would both be somewhere in our system and plumbed in so that uh, water and air both enter into here and, the, and there's actually some type of, there's media in this, uh, in these beds that, that media gives the bacteria, those beneficial bacteria, a place to grow and, and proliferate and, and they, they're there and they're constantly aerated because the bacteria like this, this genera nitrosomonas and possibly even nitrobacter are ones that need oxygen to survive. And so, anyway, this uh, biofilter would be somewhere in your, in your plumbing, in your system, that would help convert ammonia eventually to nitrate. Um, let's see. And then a solids filter. You know, this um, material that's given off by the plants, uneaten food, fish waste, pretty quickly can clog up a system and, and all this solid material is not needed. So it's removed uh, usually from a, a bottom drain uh, uh, or standpipe with a sleeve that pulls off the bottom center of the tank and taken to somewhere where it can be um, removed from the system. So the pictures here show sedimentation basins like the one in the center. And I've got a little video of that a little bit better later. Um, and like the one on the right is going to be, uh, some people might call it a cyclone or a uh, swirl separator where uh, swirling water will concentrate solid material, heavier material down uh, on the bottom and where it can be removed. So both of these have, have dumps or sump drains where that solid material, those settleable solids can be removed from the system. There are lots of other ways to, to do this. Uh, Screen, screen filters and, and others that, uh, so I, get, I mentioned this to just realize when we're thinking about this, we need, uh, we need these types of, uh, these types of uh, filters. You're gonna need some type of means to move water around. Uh, and that could be uh, a pump, an electrical pump, of some type, uh, whether it's a sump pump, uh, like you see in that bottom picture, I mean, I'm sorry, the middle picture, you see a couple different submersible pumps, and those are you know, small-ish, uh, but they'll move water around. 
Um, the one, the top picture is a centrifugal pump, uh, as well as the, the left picture. And so those will, uh, will move your water around. Um, and it's important to size these properly, um, as well as your piping system. Um, they're gonna be um, uh, integral to the whole thing. And even on the, um, some people will use airlift uh, systems or airlift technology where water is moved along with water bubble, with air bubbles in the, in the pipes. So a compressor, like you might see in the picture on the bottom right, um, as, as um, air uh, bubbles are in pipes, they are lifted up, they try to get out of those pipes and they, they lift water with it. So that's another way to move water around. So at the end of the day, the hobbyist, the commercial grower are all looking for ways that they can um, maximize their water movement and minimize their electrical costs or their input there. So, so there's, there's ways to do that. We'll even talk a little bit about um, solar in a, in a little while where I show you a video. Uh, plumbing, you know, it's, it's all part of it too. I mentioned that here. There's lots of different ways to plumb things up, <clears throat> whether it's real small scale and it might be tubing or it might be PVC pipe or it might be some sort of poly pipe. Um, this is going to um, be the method that you that you use. Try not to get as uh, as crazy as that top right picture where it's all looks like a spaghetti mess. There's just pipes everywhere, but sometimes it ends up it can be that way, and only you, as as the uh, designer, knows where everything goes. Is usually the way it works. Um, let me. I've got a video here. Um, well, Chris, before the video, you've had a couple of questions about the biofilter. Sure. Um, one is, you know, there's a time lag, but about how long does it take for the bacteria to be established? And I know that's a depends question. Yeah, that's, that's, an excellent, that's an excellent question. It could take weeks. Um, these are naturally occurring bacteria. You know, I mentioned the the genus Nitrobacter and Nitrosomonas, and those are kind of in terrestrial systems are thought to be the ones, the workhorses of that, that do a lot of that reduction. But you know, um, it's not probably been completely characterized in, in some of these aquatic or aquaponic systems, which genera bacteria are kind of doing this. It might be Nitrobacter or Nitrosomonas, but uh, there's uh, lots of others out there that are doing this job. They are naturally occurring, so when ammonia is in the, the system, it'll happen. Uh, one thing you can do is uh, kind of seed your system with uh, maybe some fish, some waste or some uh, liquid from another aquaponic system uh, would be one way to do this, to help kind of get that established. And the other would be maybe through, um, you can purchase um, um, like a starter, um, uh, liquid that would that would do this also um, so several weeks and it still could take a little bit of time for it to for them to thrive remember remember we want to make sure that the water quality is good not only for the fish and the um, plants but it's also good for those bacteria so establishing that those colonies of bacteria and that that population is dependent on um, the water quality, if it's good for them, and um, if there's lots of oxygen, for example, in the uh, in the system, and there's a place for them to, to grow. Uh, if there's I can, okay. I, was gonna, I was gonna say, it, it can take up to three weeks for this to establish itself correctly, and usually you're gonna see about two peaks. The first peak is gonna be a high total ammonia nitrogen, and once that bacteria gets established, uh, and starts working on that, then you see a high uh, peak for nitrites. And when you get bacteria that's, uh, that can take care of that, that disappears. So it takes a couple of weeks for these bacteria to settle in and uh, attack these uh, water quality parameters that builds up in these systems. So basically you're gonna have about two peaks in your system if you're monitoring your system carefully. Hey, and there's yeah, I was going to say real quick, that's a good point, Doc, and the other, and the, the part there, and I guess, and that's going to be talked about the next session, is water quality and testing. 
you know, that can be done because what Dr. Uh, Crosby's talking about is, you know, that, that testing that's so important on a weekly basis to look at things like pH and dissolved oxygen, but also ammonia and nitrate levels and, and calcium and magnesium and all those kind of things. Well, and when you're talking about that, Chris, that's going to go into the next couple of questions. Um, and one is, does the biofilter need to be refreshed from time to time? Well, I, I think so. I think you have to look at see if there's any issues. If you see spikes in that in the water quality, like Dr. Crosby might be talking about, if you see things like that happening. Um, sometimes you will see um, a system that looks kind of dead. And... Um, so if you look at these right here, um, these are bubbling and moving around. Sometimes if you're not careful, your oxygen, uh, even just something as simple as your line, your airline going to, to your biofilter, something happens to it, it goes down. Then you, you know, you, you can quickly see die off of your, of your biofilter. So it's, I think it's important just to think about keeping the, um, keeping it from fouling up. So, so taking any solid material that you get, in this system out as best you can and keeping oxygen levels high in the um, in that biofilter. And Chris, and I guess that goes into the last one we have in the chat boxes about maintenance issues. Sure. Well, I, here's a good slide to think about this. This settling basin uh, picture in the middle, I hope you can tell from this picture that there's a lot of kind of, uh, there's a lot of fish waste and uneaten food that have settled to the bottom of that. Hopefully you can see that. And so on a, uh, as, as often as needed basis, uh, that is gonna be maybe squeegeed off or maybe vacuumed out of there um, to remove those solids out of the system. So that's certainly a maintenance issue that you have, probably one of the biggest ones when we think about, uh, about an aquaponics system. Um, your tanks generally are self-cleaning, but it's a good idea to be able to, um, uh, you know, watch them daily for, for issues and problems. And then when we're thinking about the term maintenance, you know, it also entails things like keeping your equipment up and just something as simple as these pumps, uh, making sure that they're working properly, that your, uh, some of your lines, uh, uh, feed or discharge lines are, are clean. So there's, there's definitely maintenance issues. We'll probably see some more of those as we go through the, through the next little bit. Just one other thing to say here, Chris. Sure. On, on your biofilter, you're using all those uh, uh, media. And probably one thing you want to be looking for is where not those media are getting clogged up. If they're getting clogged up, that means your solid filter is not working good enough to get all the uh, solids out. And once those beads start getting uh, um, uh, packed with stuff, they don't work very well. So that's something you need to keep an eye on is uh, whether or not your media is getting clogged. That's a good point. Biofilter. Excellent point. Excellent point. Because, and you'll start to see a, your water quality will start to decline um, as you're checking it once or twice a week. You'll start to see that. Um, Let's look at this video. This shows a small aquaponics system uh, with a tank, a settling basin, and a biofilter. And you'll see some tilapia in this tank. Um, this is just going to be a round tank, about a 300 or so gallon tank. Uh, they're ready to eat. This particular one has a viewing glass on it. Um, you'll notice on each side, there's actually a, a settling basin and a biofilter. Um, and you'll notice that this company that sold this, they sold the whole, you know, you could buy the whole package, whether it was, uh, all, and we're talking about all the blue tanks. Um, here's the settling basin. You can see the water is being siphoned off the bottom center. And as it comes into a lower area, you can see all the settleable solids. Uh, I left those in there that day to take a picture so you could really kind of see um, uh, the amount. Let me go back there a little bit. So you can really kind of see the amount of solid material that's that's in this system. This is made in such a way that there's a sloped bottom that slopes back towards the right of your screen or towards that sump area. And so 
Um, as things, as the water comes in from the fish tank, it slows down or quiets down, and it's kind of like a septic tank. Things settle out as the water moves to the left of your screen, moves in that direction, um, and then it kind of rolls, the solids roll back to the right of your screen. And then there's a little bit, there's a small weir that allows the cleaner water to move over and back. And as you see, it's moving down into that and then over into a biofilter tank uh, with media and then back eventually to the, uh, to, the fish, uh, to the fish tank. Now all this is ran with a small airlift system. It's a small compressor that um, a siphon is created to move from the uh, tank to the um, settling basin and then uh, an airlift is used to take the water from the um, uh, from the biofilter to the fish tank again. I just kind of wanted to show you that there uh, as we're talking about aquaculture systems, recirculating indoor aquaculture systems. That's a good example of a small, pretty small little, little system. But you can still grow a lot of fish in there. Um, so we've talked about a lot of these needs and we've talked about a lot of um, energy dependent type things. Um, so we're running things on electricity, mostly what we talked about, some type of maybe grid type electricity. Um, so, uh, you know, you might have to have some sort of emergency generation of power if you're going to do this because you've got a lot of system. If, if they were to crash and your compress your air pumps for oxygenation of the water and for, um, movement of water, if they're down for an extended period of time, you could, really have problems depending on your, especially with the fish, depending on your density and how quickly they're gonna take up oxygen in the system. So you always have to have, whether it's backup power or some oxygen tanks or something, you need to think about having a way to reduce your risk if, um, if the power goes out. And it might even be solar. So I mentioned before that a greenhouse is really important for this in Virginia. Um, for, it's real important for the plant part of it, right? I mean, the fish don't really need light, but the plants do. And so uh, you could have it set up in such a way that you have your fish production in a garage or in another building, a metal building or a, something else, and all the fluids, all the liquids are transferred to a greenhouse that might be adjacent. Um, and the only reason I mentioned that, and that's a possibility, or you might have it all like most people do in a greenhouse. Uh, but just I mentioned that greenhouses are not very well insulated. They're not, they're not, they lose heat readily. Um, so when we do calculations on heat loss of greenhouses from polyethylene sheeting that's on the roof or on the sidewalls or even polycarbonate, you know, we, we see great heat losses. Um, and we're thinking, you know, if you're doing this year round in Virginia, um, you know, December, January, February are going to be really expensive months uh, in that greenhouse to maintain temperatures is what I'm saying. Because if you're growing tomatoes, for example, uh, the optimum temperature in a greenhouse is going to be about 60 degrees Fahrenheit at night, not much lower than that. So um, it takes a lot of uh, input, whatever your input is to heat that greenhouse, it, it's going to be expensive. So anyway, a greenhouse, you know, single, gutter connected, large, small, um, is going to be uh, really the thing to have, unless you're using um, grow lights, and that's becoming more and more popular as you um, see or hear about companies like Aero Farms and others that are doing a great job with um, growing, especially leafy greens, you know, lettuces basil in essentially buildings, warehouses that are stacked very high uh, with grow lights and uh, then potentially even connected to fish systems so they could be an aquaponic system. So greenhouse is important. Um, so in an aquaponic system, what kind of plants can you grow? Well, you can grow just about anything. Some of the work that was done by Jim Ricosi and many of the great people, uh, Charlie Schultz, that were down in the Virgin Islands, they grew just about everything you could think of in their systems, uh, in their float bed outdoor systems. Um, 
and we've seen good success with, with aquaponic systems in different different crops. What you mostly see, and a good for a starter, is going to be some type of leafy green. Um, the pictures in the center of you see the lettuce and the uh, kale and, and things like bok choy and uh, Swiss chard and basil, they can do very well in these systems. Um, and cul other culinary herbs and basil uh, obviously can do well. Uh, tomatoes can do okay, you know, looking at different systems, peppers and cucumbers also. Um, it kind of all depends on a couple things. It depends on what you desire as a, if you're homesteading or in a small urban um, system, you know, what you want, what you want to grow. Or um, if you're on a commercial scale, it's, you know, is this commercially viable? Can you make money by growing cucumbers? I uh, like those baked alpha cucumbers in the top picture. Can you, uh, can you make money? Does the economics work? Uh, so, um, so many different things can be grown uh, when you're thinking about the plant production. And we think about fish and <clears throat> might have talked a little bit last week if, if some of you were on the, uh, the call last week and probably we'll talk more next week if you can join us. Um, uh, lots of different fish probably can be grown in these systems. Tilapia is one that you hear of most that are well suited to aquaponics. Uh, and mostly because they can handle fairly poor water quality. And um, sometimes you get that in an aquaponic system when you compare it to a, when you compare it just to a standalone recirculating aquaculture system where all you're doing is growing fish. Um, so tilapia can be a good one. Um, even ornamental fish, if, if you're interested in, not food fish, but if you're interested in, um, uh, you know, a, a, an enterprise of sorts, then, potentially ornamental fish for the sales to the um, um, pet store, you know, industry or aquarium industry. Uh, maybe catfish, maybe bluegill. Dr. Crosby can talk, talk a lot about bluegill. He's kind of, uh, between him and Dr. Neri, they, they've spearheaded some efforts recently to look at bluegill indoors and outdoors. And um, so yeah. there might be potential there. Um, well, bluegill has a couple of, uh, pluses on its side. One, you don't need to have a special permit to own them. Two, they're probably far easier to get a hold of than tilapia. And three, you know, they are very tolerant of uh, cool water so they could be in a system all year long and not worry too much about temperatures falling below 55 degrees. They just take a longer time to grow. You know, the reason everybody focus on tilapia is because they are tolerant of uh, poor water quality and they grow fast, but you will need a permit to have these guys regardless. Then you have to be ability to uh, produce fingerlings for your system, which means you need to set up a reproductive system to uh, get baby fry and raise them up to little fingerlings to put in your system. I yeah, hope that that's, no, that's a great point. Would you mind, Doc, mentioning the the, uh, the permitting thing you, you alluded to earlier, talking a little, just a little bit more about that? Well, the biggest thing, if you plan to sell uh, fish like tilapia, catfish, bluegills, and trout, as a food fish to somebody, you're going to need a, a a permit from the Department of Wildlife Resources, which is runs about ten bucks, and you can go online to get that. Now, if you're doing tilapia, you're going to need a a uh, exotic species permit as well as a hold and sell permit for for that. Uh, uh, so you're talking about a little bit more money for that. But ornamental fish, you won't need any permit for that uh, for growing or selling right now. Only if uh, sport fish like trout, bluegills, catfish, you're going to need that. And tilapia because it's an exotic species. Yeah, perfect, perfect. I think it's worth mentioning too while we're on this, this area is re-mentioning what you, or reiterating what you said again about the uh, um, tilapia are sometimes hard to get a hold of as, as opposed to some others because um, there's certain breeders in, in, in the U.S. and they are, uh, you know, a lot of times they're selling large batches, but more and more you can get smaller and smaller amounts. And you, you, will need, 
you will need a permit regardless where not you eat the top yourself. The Department of Wildlife Resources uh, requires to have exotic species permit to have them. That's right. Regardless regardless if you go uh, eat them yourself. Now the other species like catfish, bluegills, and trout, you don't need a permit if you plan just to use them for your own use. Only if you plan to sell them to the public, if you decide to try to make a little, uh, some extra funds from your operation, you're trying to sell sell some to uh, to the public, you're gonna need a permit. The same with tilapia, again, you're gonna need two permits for that. Yep, sounds good. Thank you, Doc. Very well done there. Um, let's look uh, here at at um, the different types of aquaponic systems we might see, and uh, this is where we'll kind of discuss some of these plant production, um, whether they're going to be uh, closed loop or maybe open loop systems, and whether they might have substrate in them. Um, you know, a good example is this picture right in the center that's going to be a um, that's going to be a closed loop system where it's an an, um, an ebb and flood system and uh, that's just got river rock or uh, pea gravel type material where the plants are just growing in that the uh, there you see uh, different types of lettuces that are and some arugula that's just um, that that media the rock material is just a substrate for root growth um, and, and so it just keeps things from uh, you, you, your plant from falling over and, 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 fall, and falling down. Uh, so let's go through and, and uh, like I mentioned, uh, most aquaponic systems are described by their plant production system that they, that they utilize. Uh, mostly in hobby systems, what we see people using are media beds or media systems, different types of media or NFT, which would stand for, it's just an acronym, it stands for Nutrient Film Technique, and that's was coined, that term was coined years and years ago. I see those mostly for your hobby systems. And then in larger systems, more commercial systems, we see a lot less media beds and more float beds and NFT systems. So as we look here, let's talk about this Nutrient Film Technique or this NFT system. Uh, and how it works. It consists of channels, a frame, a collection um, vessel, uh, or, or uh, some, yeah, a, a pump. Um, it, it's usually thought of as a closed loop system, so it's a recirculating system. So in this top picture, you see a small scale one. These uh, channels that you see, those white looking tubes with square openings in them, they're about four feet long. And each one of those openings is a plant space. So each of those uh, channels has got one, two, three, four, five, six, six uh, plant spaces. And there's uh, two, two, six of those across. So this whole thing will hold about 36 plant spaces. And it's spaced in such a way that it's ideal for something like lettuce, which are planted on about eight inch centers. So eight inches apart in every direction. Um, but you can see that in a, in a very simple way, and this would be just a, just a plain old, let's say a hydroponic system where you've got um, a reservoir in the bottom that has synthetic fertilizer in it, um, is pumped, there's a pump in there, pumps it up to the side where they're working, and then it flows down and bathes the roots in nutrients. It's collected in that larger pipe and then drains back into that tote, if that makes sense. That's the way that flows. And the picture on the bottom, and then there's a frame. There's a frame that, um, let me try to get my uh, laser pointer up here. There's a, a frame, of course, right here. And uh, like I said, and these uh, have frames also. This, is, this would be more of a, an A wooden frame. And you can imagine that this system in this picture is going to uh, use um, space in the greenhouse more efficiently. Uh, because of the way it's designed. Um, but this is just a hydroponic system with a tank buried in the ground that has nutrient solution in it, some type of fertilizer. It's pumped up to this other end and these trays uh, hold the plants. So you can see smaller plants here and plants ready to harvest on this side. And it flows through, bathes the nutrient, bathes the roots in nutrients. They take, the plants take up what they need 
and it flows back into the tank and continues that cycle. So in that way, it's a closed loop system. All right. Uh, here's more examples of NFT systems, both in aquaponics and in uh, just a uh, hydroponic. But some of these are some of these are aquaponics. Some of them are, are using just just fertilizer. But you can see the top uh, left picture. There's strawberries growing. You can see that uh, middle picture at the top. The roots from the lettuce um, are just kind of end up matting together as they grow because they grow so well in there. And you can see they're pretty white and clean. Uh, really, not a lot of root rot issues or problems um, that can happen in these systems. But in that particular picture, we don't see it. Um, and you can see the variety of things that can be grown, even in that bottom um, picture uh, in the center of the large Swiss chard variety that's, um, that's grown there. Um, and that's an aquaponic system. And you'll notice how dark green those leaves are, are, are looking. Um, <clears throat> I'll, mention, <coughs> I'll mention the uh, bottom left picture. When you think about these channels, most of the pictures I've shown you are ones that you would buy from a company that makes these. There are several different companies, but <clears throat> that particular uh, facility is using two-inch PVC pipe, and that that uh, is just something you'd buy at a hardware store or um, um, or, or a big box uh, retailer that would sell that, and you would just make holes with a drill bit, a hole saw, or a uh, um, step drill bit and uh, for your plant spaces. All right. Okay. Let me see here. Give me a second. Okay. Um, so a float bed is going to be a little different. This is going to uh, be one where plants are floating on a raft of sorts in a in a pond of water, let's say, uh, you know, whether you've made a, um, a 12 foot wide by 48 foot long bed out of lumber and you've lined it um, and, and maybe eight inches deep um, and you've got that full of, uh, in a hydroponic system, that would be nutrient solution or an aquaponic system, that would be the water from the fish tanks going into the, uh, would be going into the, uh, the float bed. Um, the bottom picture kind of shows some lettuce on rafts um, and movement of water is through this float bed. Um, it's nice because you can move these rafts down uh, down the, uh, the float bed and harvest from one end every week. So you're harvesting you know, one end of the place of the um, of your float bed system and and planting new new transplants on the other one. And that kind of can, can be illustrated in this top uh, center picture where you see the, that's an aquaponic system where we have four fish tanks. Um, they go through some filters and then uh, the, that wastewater enters into the, uh, the float bed. And you can see that we harvest off the side that's closest to you in the picture and you transplant or put in the small plants in the other side and you just can push them along and, uh, and they're in rafts. You can look at the picture of the rafts, uh, various ones here. These are, um, these are rafts, the white rafts that look like polystyrene are ones that you can buy that you know, come usually 18 holes per, per raft. Each raft is about two feet by four feet long, uh, or they can have uh, you know, different, different spacing. Uh, you can see the picture on the bottom where the small plants, the transplants are being put into that, into that uh, plant space that you know, in the raft, and then they're just set, set in the system. Um, you can see the roots on the picture on the left side and a little bit on the right side, but that uh, top right picture is ready to harvest. The, that lettuce is ready to go uh, to eat, to package and sell whatever you're going to, whatever you're going to do with it. And these, these rafts can be made out of, um, other materials uh, like uh, insulation board that you might find at home improvement warehouses. Let me show you this video. This is of a um, an indoor 
uh, facility with grow lights and there's a float bed system here. This is patterned off some work that was done in the Virgin Islands um, and their exact system there. And it consists of fish tanks, uh, filter tanks, mineralization tanks, and the float bed system. So we're gonna go through and, and it just takes a minute or two to look at this. This is where a lot of the waste material is taken and, and it's uh, mineralized. And so through aeration, uh, you get a better utilization of that waste and it's kind of broken down further by bacteria and can be used in other spots and other places. Uh, you could see the blue fish tanks and here you see the, um, the float beds. They don't really look like float beds, but those are float beds. Uh, we can see the rafts. You can see the grow lights in this situation. Uh, these are high intensity discharge lights. You can't tell by looking at it, but those lights are on tracks and they actually move. So you don't see a great density of lights, but the lights do move back and forth uh, linearly uh, in a lineal, lineal fashion uh, along that float bed. Um, you can see they've got uh, different ways. Okay. So that was a pretty neat system. Um, it was all indoors. We talked a little bit about indoors and greenhouses and uh, with grow lights though that's becoming a lot more possible but you notice too that they were growing a lot of leafy greens which do real well. I'll mention now a media bed system. Um, this is you know could look like the one we're showing here with gravel or vermiculite. Um, it's going to be you know four maybe up to as many as eight inches deep with media. It could be, depending on if you're using a bag system, it'd be deeper. Um, this could be a flood and drain system. Uh, and I'll show you another example of that in a video. Uh, or it could be a drain to waste system, uh, which would be a closed, uh, I'm sorry, an open loop system. Um, one pump and gravity, that's what I mentioned here. And really that goes with, along with all these aquaponic systems. I probably failed to mention that before, but what you want to use is gravity as best you can uh, to, to your advantage. And having one pump is probably the, the easiest way to do that. It's going to be your less, least costly way from energy standpoint and capital expense, but it's also going to be the way that you want to do it uh, just from a balancing standpoint. Um, moving water around, if you've got multiple pumps, Sometimes things overflow, sometimes things go dry, you don't have enough, uh, uh, enough water in certain times. So having one pump and utilizing gravity is, is the best way to do it. Um, so this particular one right here is, uh, in this picture, there's a sump pump in that fish tank and it's, it comes on on a timer, it energizes, it floods this bed and that timer then cuts it off and it's high enough that it, everything flows back into that fish tank. Um, and in this case, the, the media is acting like its own biofilter. So we've got bacteria that are growing in here, beneficial bacteria. But media beds or containers can look different and they can have lots of different ones. There's a picture in the center with strawberries and it's a flood and drain system with rice hulls because it was available at the time and somebody might have availability of that. Pea gravel, you see some pea gravel in the top picture mixed with expanded clay pebbles. Uh, and I'll show you a video in a little while where we have just expanded clay pebbles. They're popular in kind of the hobby hydroponics industry and, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll see those. And even things like the tomatoes that are in um, the picture there in grow bags with soilless media, bark-based or peat-based media, you see uh, that's a drain to waste system, but the tomatoes are growing in, in, a, uh, in media. Let me show you this now then. Uh, this is um, a video of an aquaponics trailer we've set up and we kind of take it around the state and do some youth and adult education on aquaponics with the trailer. What I want to illustrate here is a media bed system. This is. Uh, this is clay pebbles um, in this system. And it's on one side of the one side of it. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started and I'll talk as we go. Um, 
But you can see here, we've got IBC containers that have been cut and you can see the expanding clay pebbles <laughs> and the water's run into them. And it's draining back into here. Excuse that water, it's really brown because we're trying to leach a lot of that dust off the pebbles. And this is being run off uh, these two small solar panels um, that came as a kit with a kind of a fountain kit with a, with a little sump pump. And the sump pump is in there and you can see it, it's pumping water from the tank below into these upper beds. You can see it's starting to flood. And I've got this one dug down so you can see the siphon that we have installed in there. And that's the drain for that particular side. And on the other side, there's another drain for the, for the, other, for the other side. So water is constantly going in there. And let me go to the next video. Uh, here we go. Um, this is a continuation of that video a little bit later. Um, so water is still going on. That's flooding. And that water is starting to drain out a little bit, just a little bit, not much. It's starting to get pretty high. And you can imagine plants would be planted in this. There'd be more clay pebbles and plants would be planted in there. Anyway, it's rising up. Water's continuing to go into both tanks, as you can see, both, both sides, I guess. It's rising up, rising up. And it's starting to flow a little heavier. And the other side is doing the same thing. It's starting to flow out. <clears throat> and again, normally this would be a lot clearer water, but we've got to clean these, uh, these expanded clay pebbles. <clears throat> and so this would be your fish tank. This would be where your fish are living and your media bed above it. Um, and it's starting to get higher and higher and higher. And so the, at this point, the roots would be uh, submerged in water. They'd be taking up nutrients. A um, little bit more coming out. But as you look at the other side, it's starting to drain fully. And if you notice in just a few seconds, you're going to see a full pipe drain. There you go. So the far side is draining completely right now. So the siphon has taken effect. And what it's doing, it's completely flushing the water out of that. So it's, it's flooded. Now it's draining very quickly. And it's because of that little U siphon. So you can see on the far side and on this side, it's not quite got high enough yet to, uh, and that use siphon is buried on the other side. You can't see it, but it's draining back uh, that whole other uh, partial IBC. Um, and this one is on the one closest to us is still draining, but there you go. Now we're getting the siphon effect. You can see it's a full pipe of water. Um, and it's really starting to drain that, uh, to drain that down. You can almost see it draining, right? And that, and this, the water's still coming in to it, but it's really starting to drain down quickly, as you notice those levels, you know, dropping down. Uh, this is similar. This is a bell type siphon. It's called a U siphon. And just, this just requires a, uh, in this case, one inch PVC fittings. You can see it's draining down now. And it takes a little bit of time because of the volume and the pipe size. And that can vary on how you build this. Um, and you can see the other side has stopped draining. It's completely drained and is finished. So it's and now it's starting to fill back up again, flood again. And this one is still a full pipe, still draining, you know, the a lot of the many gallons that are in there. You can see it's starting to drain down. And there's a lot less of the uh, pea gravel in there. Normally this would be full. So it's just a U-shaped siphon as we, uh, as we kind of look at it here a little bit. Yeah, I'll try to, yeah, pull back a little bit of this. Um, gravel, pea gravel. You can kind of see, I'll stop it here. This is just a, uh, a 45 uh, degree fitting, uh, two of those and two 90 degree fittings. And one is connected to a drain at the, in the very center. And the other one is short just a little bit so that it allows um, a little bit of water to remain in your vessel. So 
the way this works is a very simple system. Uh, an air pocket gets trapped in the top, the uppermost point of that 90, that elbow. And um, when the wire gets high enough, that air bubble tends to get flushed down. And once it does, it creates a siphon and just quickly drains everything else. A pretty simple system, but I, I kind of wanted to illustrate this as a lot of you are thinking about media bed systems potentially. And, um, and then once it draws air in, once it gets low enough and it, that bottom section draws air, it stops. And this is just being run off um, a pretty inexpensive solar system with a pump. And what happens is that solar is, um, it's a DC powered sump pump. And so as soon as you plug it into the solar, it starts running. You can have it on off switch, but it just starts running in this case. And uh, as long as it's daylight hours and they're making the, the PV's making power, you can, um, you'll have power and the pump runs. And that works out well in this flood and drain system because um, at nighttime it doesn't have to run. Um, at daytime it, it does run. And I just wanted to kind of have, show you that example uh, there. The other thing that I'll, I'm gonna move along a little bit because uh, we've got, we don't have a whole lot of time left. Um, we've talked a lot about recirculating aquaponic systems, and that's what most people are, are thinking about. They're thinking about these, um, these closed loop systems, but a decoupled system would be one where we use something like the picture here with uh, drained to waste media containers with, with uh, vine crops, uh, where it would be a one way flow out of the fish tank, out of the fish system into the, to the plants. And it, that, that wouldn't be recirculated back to the fish system. Um, this does allow a lot more, um, a lot more independence uh, of each system. Sometimes with vine crops, you might need to add additional fertilizer or, or maybe even potentially some type of uh, pesticide. And it's difficult when things are coupled together to do that. So, um, so this can be one that's, uh, that's beneficial for some growers. Let me show you this video real quick. This is a decoupled system using one fish tank. All the lettuce that you see here is fed off this decoupled system. Uh, that one fish tank system uh, where the waste is taken out. So this is just a large conical bottom tank about close to 700 gallons with tilapia in it. Um, there happens to be a, uh, a small uh, filter, a polygeyser type filter here, it, or an affinity bead filter, this green thing, um, that does some biofiltration, but it does a lot more really mechanical filtration of removing solids. And then it dumps solid material or, um, into this tank. Uh, so we dump into here occasionally, we get solid material. And then from this tank, we move, um, we independently move that solid material out of the fish system. So it's removed from the fish system. And much like that indoor system that we saw that was in Kentucky, uh, it goes to, in this case, these IBC containers for further mineral, mineralization. So it's dumped into here and it's aerated heavily. This is a uh, heavily aerated uh, digester, um, an aerobic digester, and you can see uh, the tank. And the, so that, that's also, it's, it's being taken from here and then, put, and then uh, recirculated in the NFT system for the lettuce uh, in a container over there. So it's then, it's taken out a big plug of it and it's used over there with the, with the lettuce. It's also being used here with these tomatoes, uh, where we've got uh, tomatoes growing in recirculating systems. We have a reservoir there. In that case, we have a kind of an NFT system for tomatoes. Um, in this case, where we've got, <clears throat> I mean, I'm sorry, we had a bag culture system that's that's uh, flood and flooded. We've got an NFT, and then we've got a, um, fl a um, perlite-based media system here where the, the, the fish waste is fed directly to the roots of the plant. Um, so you can see that um, 
it's all recirculated here, but it's once it's taken out of the fish system, it's going to the peppers, in this case here, or the, or the tomatoes, and then the lettuce on the other end. And these are just a small yellow bell. Uh, I'm gonna stop that and we're gonna continue because we're running out of time. I wanna look at potential crops quickly um, as we think about- Chris, yeah, Chris, yeah. don't worry about the time. As long as they wanna stay with us, we'll stay with them. Okay, all right, we'll, right. we'll, we'll continue and Chris, on. Yes. you may answer this question when you start talking about the plants, uh, but this person wants to know about scale. Commercial float systems have like 36 holes per sheet. So that's 36 whole, you know, heads of lettuce. So what should the production for a hobby flood drain system be as estimate? Yeah, so oh, that's, that's a great question. Let me answer it when we're talking here about, about lettuce. It's a good time because you've got to think about these crops. You've got to think about timing. Um, that I thought you probably days. would, so that's why yeah, I wanted no, to get that to you. Yeah, no, that's perfect, Cynthia. Thank you. Um, when we think about leafy greens and lettuce here, uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, lots of different types, um, head, romaine, uh, leaf lettuce, lalarosas, lots of different ones. Um, here's just some varieties that you might think about. Uh, um, they're grown in rock wool or oasis. They're started that way and then they're put into those systems. So the crop time, what I've got here is approximately 40 days from seed to harvest. The general rule of thumb, what we think about in these aquaponics or hydroponic systems with lettuce is about six weeks from the time, um, about six weeks from the time that we put them in the system, whether that's that float bed that has 36 holes in it uh, or uh, or in the NFT system, that space. So, so you kind of think about that and divide your production. If you want to have production every week or harvest every week, which many people do for their own use or for a consistent production going to, uh, to sell, you uh, divide it that way and think, I'm going to harvest, I'm going to, uh, let's just say you had a system that had uh, six of those rafts, for example which would be a float bed that would be about uh, 25 feet long and about um, four feet wide. Um, and you'd have, uh, you'd plant every week, you'd plant 36 transplants or small plants um, into that raft and you'd put it in the float bed and the next week you'd plant another one. And by the time you were planting your sixth one, you'd be harvesting the first one you planted. Um, so it's staggered in that way. Um, but, you know, that's just one example, but that's just the way you need to think about this and your production needs and what, you know, for your family, extended family, community, whatever you, whatever you're growing, uh, you need to kind of think about what my needs are and, you know, how many, do I need, do I need one variety of lettuce or do I need maybe some bok choy, some Swiss chard, basil, and, and maybe, uh, you know, a nice, kind of uh, red bib lettuce like you see on the bottom picture there. Um, so that's the way I think you kind of have to approach it, what you need. Seed sources for lettuce are going to be the many out there. These are two I mentioned just because we've used them and they have a very good selection of, of lettuce seeds. Um, but it goes for whatever you're growing, uh, tomatoes or, or, or uh, cantaloupes or strawberries or you know whatever. Uh, lots of different seed sources out there. You kind of end up uh, finding your own your own favorites. Um, yeah, we kind of talked about this. Just lots of things out there. We think about leafy greens and lettuce and being one of the the ones that you start at start using first. Um, you know, lots of things to think about. When we think about lettuce, you look um, thirty years ago, primarily iceberg lettuce or crisp head lettuce was. That's what everybody had. That's where I ate. Uh, salad bars had that. And you look at, you know, a real trend in the last 30 years where now it's mostly um, other types of lettuces, uh, leafy lettuce, uh, bib lettuce, all the others, as opposed to, um, to crisp head, which you still see, obviously. I mean, it's still out there, but there's been a real upheaval in that, in that industry. 
Um, when we think about a hydroponic system, I'll just, well, you know, I'm going to, for the sake of time, I'm going to go on through that. Um, like I mentioned before, making these small plants or making transplants is something you have to think about uh, for lettuce or something, especially that every week you're going <coughs> to, you're going to seed down. <coughs> every week you're going to transplant, every week you're going to harvest, as opposed to peppers or uh, cucumbers or tomatoes, which you're not going to be doing that every week. You're going to be doing it a lot less frequently. Um, this, most of these are going to be every week, and you're going to be growing them in something like that bottom picture, those rock wool cubes, um, where that, that allows you just to be able to move and transplant the lettuce easily. Um, that media doesn't add anything in terms of nutrition to the plant. It's just a substrates for it's a substrate for the roots to grow through and you can move and transplant uh, your plants into into your system. Um, germination is usually a pretty quick area a time frame but it's something you need to dedicate a small area of your production to uh, to make sure that you, you start well. If you start well with good plants um, you, you're going to be fine. Um, so just some of the things that you do every week with, like we've talked about it right through this presentation, you're transplanting, you're harvesting, you're checking water quality, uh, you're scouting for things like insects, disease, and problems. We haven't mentioned that, but when you're growing plants, even growing fish, you're constantly, you know, it's a good thing that it's labor intensive because you really need to be there to check on things, to make sure that, that things aren't going wrong. Uh, we're not going to really talk to it about it at all today, but a whole another hour or two could be just dedicated to to pest issues uh, in the greenhouse. So, uh, and how to how to avoid them, how to get rid of them. Tomatoes might be one. Uh, these are all what you see here are large scale production systems, but <clears throat> but many people like tomatoes, and they could be done in an aquaponic system, like we uh, showed you in some of that in that video. Um, they're going to have uh, a lot more uh, management intensity than, than leafy greens, uh, a lot more to do, a lot more duties uh, associated with tomatoes. But at the end of the day, you've got, you've got a great fruit that everybody likes. Um, everybody loves to eat tomato sandwiches and I guess put a little bacon on them too, maybe. Um, and if as an enterprise, people like to buy tomatoes. So um, just a little bit of information here. Um, different systems will go through this. Um, this is what it might look like if you just had a house of tomatoes and uh, you know much larger scale. Um, I'll, I'll put this out here just to say the fertilization of tomatoes is a little more complex than leafy greens. So if we're looking at just fertilizers and a hydroponic system, this is what I would use on the left. And on the right kind of shows that from the T to two, which is transplanted to the second cluster of tomatoes from the second cluster, then the next column is from the second cluster of tomatoes to the fourth cluster of tomatoes. And then the third column is the, towards the finish of the crop. You'll see different levels of nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, potentially. So it changes as the crop grows, whereas leafy greens, lettuce and herbs are more static in their requirements. So I guess what I'm saying is, when we look at these, I mentioned the decoupled systems and how vine crops especially can benefit from that because you might have other fertilizer additions. A decoupled aquaponic system kind of gives you that ability. So when we look at tomatoes, I'll just, you know, I'll just uh, look here. When we think about tomatoes, you're clipping them up. These are one main stem. So as opposed to as compared to say your garden tomatoes where you've got multiple uh, suckers that have fruits, uh, fruit on them and you've got cages in the garden, these are strung up with those clips, those brown clips and a string and there's one stem. You can see those little clips there, you just uh, use them, clip to that clip around the vine, around the stem and onto that. Sometimes you can wrap the, uh, wrap the string around them. And you see lots of clusters of tomatoes here. Sorry, it's a little, little wobbly. And you'll notice that we have one main stem. So we take all these side shoots off. We just snap them off. Um, and these are also called suckers, right? You've called them suckers maybe in the garden. 
we take those off because those would produce flowers and then fruit off that sucker at every leaf axle. So between the stem and the leaf, you're gonna see these side shoots arise. So in the greenhouse, because, and in these types of systems, because uh, space is at a premium, we are constantly taking those side shoots or we are taking those side shoots off. Just kind of wanted to illustrate that and some of the labor that's required. Uh, at the end of the day, then you've got, you've got fruit that you can eat or sell. So as we kind of move through this and kind of finish up and have touched on things kind of lightly, um, we want to think about um, aquaponics and using things like um, a good ratio of feeding. So um, certain amounts of food per day, per amount of growing area is going to give you uh, your nutrients for your plants. Um, some of that's been worked out by Jim Ricosi. Um, we'll talk about that in a second, but, but utilizing those designs uh, are, are helpful. Um, <clears throat> that constant food supply is important because at the end of the day, again, at the end of the day, your input into the fish system is what's driving your plant production. Um, you might have to supplement uh, removing solids is always important and controlling that pH. Maybe using biological control, I mentioned that here. Again, we're not gonna go into pest issues, but in a greenhouse, whether it's a small or large greenhouse, uh, you have the ability as a grower to release beneficial insects. And instead of spraying pesticides, if you get white flies or spider mites or aphids, uh, you can probably find a natural predator that somebody sells that can be released in there. Many of you have heard of ladybugs as a good general predator. So that's just one example of, of how you can do that. So <clears throat> we'll look here at this float bed system that was figured out uh, a while back, 60 to 80 grams of fish food per square meter per day kind of gives you a good output in that system. Usually when you're doing an NFT, it's quite a bit less than that uh, feeding rate. So those are the two numbers I want you to get off this slide and, and consider. Uh, that have been used for a while in float bed systems and NFT systems. So we definitely, I think you all are all interested in some type of aquaponic system and we are seeing that more and more in our work that there's a, certainly a growth in this hobby and backyard and homesteading and urban situation. Um, so lots of, lots of systems in the U.S. and it's, it's evident if you go on YouTube and uh, look at, um, for example, look at, um, type in aquaponics. You're gonna find lots and lots of videos of people with their own systems um, um, showing you what they've done. Um, there are a lot more publications, and I'll show you some publications and resources in just a minute. I, I wanted to leave you with those. Um, now, is this all simple and easy? No. No, and, and even to say that we've figured all this out and that research at land grants and other places has figured uh, all the production has been figured out. No, it, it hasn't. We're still constantly working on, on things. Um, and lots of people around the country are. Fortunately in Virginia, uh, we between Virginia Tech and Virginia State, we've got a lot of people that are uh, working on a lot of these aquaponics things, uh, issues, problems, challenges. Um, from a food safety standpoint to a production standpoint. So, <clears throat> so staggered, staggered systems, sometimes it's hard to find and source plants and, and, and fish potentially, so that's a challenge. Uh, if you're marketing this, um, you know, it's, it's two distinct marketing channels that you're gonna work on. Um, the combination of these two very difficult systems, the standalone systems of indoor Recirculating, recirculating aquaculture and hydroponics uh, are, are, like I said, difficult on their own. When you combine them, it becomes even more. Um, and I'll mention regulation here at the end. I don't know that it's a problem, but I think it's something you need to be aware of, not necessarily as a homestead area or an urban aquaculture uh, uh, aquaponist, but um, from a commercial standpoint, food safety regulation, um, uh, is, is important, and it's important as we want a safe food supply, um, and it's important as we look at those, those food safety regulations. Uh, it doesn't touch you as much as a very small scale producer, uh, 
Well, let me uh, stop, uh, butt in here for a second. Sure. Um, we're going to have another uh, one of these programs on September 1st where we're going to look at uh, food safety for aquaponics and hydroponics. And it'll be at the same time where we talk about a little bit about FISMA, a plan, a safety plan for aquaponics, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the research that we've done looking at some of these small scale uh, aquaponic systems for food safety. So, uh, and it'd be uh, very uh, good if you go to this particular program to learn because uh, if you plan to sell this, any of this product, you need to be aware of what regulations that are out there so you can be better prepared. Um, that's my, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Doc. I appreciate that. Well said. Yeah, it, it's an important part of it. Um, <clears throat> so I think I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about resources here. I've got a few here. Um, and this will be recorded, so you'll be able to find this. But let me share quickly um, <clears throat> some uh, areas here that I think are worth are worth looking at. Um, this is one. This is um, and it, this is one of the resources on that list. This is going to be a publication that's it's a few years old now, but it's very good um, from the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, and it's about small-scale aquaponic production. Um, you can see here that uh, the picture that you see, it's got a lot of IVC totes, and this is a worldwide type publication. You know, it's, it's all over the, uh, meant for all over the world. And uh, they do a nice job here. It's a very long, lengthy publication, but it's nice in that it, um, at the end, it's got a lot of pictures, a lot of diagrams on how to build a system. So I think it's worth looking at, and it's, uh, you can see the address right here is, F if you Google FAO aquapon a small scale aquaponic food production, you'll find this pretty easily. Um, I think this is worth taking a look at. Um, another one I wanted to mention here as a resource, uh, is going to be the Aquaponics Association. This is a, an American association, uh, uh, North American, I guess, and um, it's it's pretty good. They have a conference every year. They've got some resources on this website. Uh, the conferences are very good. They're usually two two day conferences or three. Um, very informative um, trade show also. Um, the, the other thing, though, aside from that conference educational piece, is really the um, the ability to network with growers, the ability to uh, talk to other people that are doing the same kind of thing that you're interested in or, or, or wanting to do, they're wanting to do. So it's worth, worth checking out this association, and if you've got the ability, go to one of the conferences. Um, I'll mention this right here. Uh, if you go to um, SHRAC, this is, SHRAC stands for Southern Regional Aquaculture Center. And uh, this is a good repository of a lot of information. These, these uh, fact sheets, uh, if you go to just SHRAC at TAMU, which is Texas A&M University .edu, You'll get this, and you'll find all kinds of aquaculture type fact sheets, and on alligators, beginning aquaculture, fee fishing, uh, pond construction, predators, a whole lot of information. If we go under miscellaneous right here, you're going to see uh, some miscellaneous ones, and you're going to see uh, some really good ones here uh, on aquaponics, vegetable transplants building a simple on at home aquaponic system. So these are ones that are, again, this Shrek website and, and going here is, is worth, the, worth the effort. Now I'll mention lastly, uh, this one here, Principles of Small Scale Aquaculture. A lot of the things that we talked about today are gonna be in this publication. Um, hopefully, I've covered it well. Uh, but these are some things that we put together a few years ago and um, uh, 
hopefully it'll kind of put down on paper some of the things we talked about today. Okay, I am going to um, go here. And I'm going to say that's about it. We're a little over time. I apologize for that. But Cynthia, uh, if we have any questions, I'm welcome. I welcome them. And I want to thank hey, you all for, for we, everything. All right, we have one more, and it pertains to food for fish. One person wanted to know if a good food for fish would be duckweed. Uh, okay. But I'm thinking probably more in these systems you want a quality uh, fish food that's appropriate for the uh, species. Uh, if, yeah. if you were if you were going with a complete self reliant system, and you got tilapia, sometimes duckweed can be used. Uh, a lot of times, duckweed is used in a system where we got actually have chickens, uh, duckweed, and fish, and. Uh, that's in a very self-reliant systems where you see that where you're at very low production. Uh, if you go try to do higher production, then I would avoid that. Yeah, Dr. Crosby knows a lot more about fish nutrition than I do, but I will say that uh, the duckweed situation is one that duckweed, while it's 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 very sustainable when you think about it. You know, growing the duckweed and then feeding the fish with the duckweed, but uh, at the end of the day, duckweed provides there's a lot of water in, 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 in it, and it provides not as much protein as you probably need. So when we think about, again, Dr. Crosby could talk for probably a day about fish nutrition, uh, where that, uh, you know, the fish need a lot of protein in order to put that muscle mass on. So uh, when you think about animal agriculture and you think of that term food conversion ratio, whether it's with cattle or pigs or fish, uh, you're taking uh, protein and trying to add muscle to whatever animal you've got. Cynthia, any more? That looks like it. Everybody's saying thank you and excellent yeah. presentations and stuff. So I don't Good. see anything after the duck week. Well, thank you everybody for your attention today. And remember that next week, is it Tuesday, Doc? Yeah. Tuesday, next Tuesday, we got another talk coming up. Same time, same place. And we're going to have one uh, following week. This is almost every week now until about the uh, end of September. Now, let me ask you real quick. Uh, hit the yes button if you thought this was a, a, you got what you needed from this presentation. I'm just trying to get some numbers. So if you could hit the yes button, maybe, so we can get a tally of, uh, of uh, how many people thought this was uh, good. At, got good enough uh, information from if you could do that for me please Hit the you're getting button. a lot of yeses and thank yous so in the chat okay. box okay now i gotta figure out how many how the camera okay thank you thanks everybody we'll okay. see you next week